To say that this is one of the craziest stories I have ever covered would be a complete understatement. There are so many twists and turns, so many key players, and so many jaw on the floor moments. I try to keep it as simple as possible, but also as detailed as possible. And with that, buckle up, because I am about to take you on an insane ride. welcome or welcome back thank you so much for being here it's so greatly appreciated it truly truly is before we get started let me give you my usual disclaimer this video is for educational purposes only please do not take what I say as fact please always do your own research and come to your own conclusions next if you have not liked subscribed or commented yet please consider doing so because it really helps me out and I really really appreciate it I really could use it okay so let's start with the number one key player in this story, the girl that has been dubbed by prosecutors as the female Charles Manson, 21-year-old Sarah Pender. Sarah was born on May 29th, 1979 in Indiana to parents Bonnie Prosser and Roland Pender. When Sarah was five years old, her parents split. Her mom moved to California and her father raised her and her sister Jennifer as a single parent. By the time Sarah was seven years old, though, her mother had moved back to Indiana and she was seeing her girls every weekend and all summer long. Sarah graduated from Lawrence Central High School in 1997. She experimented in drugs and became somewhat boy crazy during these years, but by senior year, she had gotten her act together and she graduated. She went on to Purdue University where she studied physics and had dreams of working in a particle accelerator lab and pursuing a career in biochemistry. Unfortunately, after her freshman year, money had run out and Sarah found herself working as a secretary for a construction company called Carl E. Most and Sons. She started off as a secretary and worked her way up to reading blueprints. She was on her way to attending drafting school so that she could go out to job sites and give potential clients estimates. By the age of 20, Sarah had a good job, her own car, and no debt. That's when she would meet 22-year-old Richard Hull. And that's when my mother's famous line would ring true, the people you hang out with are the people you become. The two met at a concert in July of 2000 when a mutual friend introduced them. Richard Hull was born on November 4th, 1977 in Noblesville, Indiana. He was a high school football star, one of three children, and raised by a single mother and his grandmother. His parents split when he was four. He spent some weekends with his dad, but for the most part, that didn't really last long. And Rick would later say that the first time he saw his mom cry was when he won a wrestling match. And he asked his mom why his father wasn't at the match like everybody else's fathers were. And that's terrible. His mom would work up to three jobs at a time trying to raise her kids. She was a cashier at Dairy Queen. She worked at a pizzeria and she folded clothes at a laundromat. Within a month of the two dating, they were living together in Sarah's one-bedroom apartment. Hull used to be a bouncer, but because of his criminal past, he was unemployed when the two met. Surprisingly, this didn't bother Sarah whatsoever, and shortly into dating, she was already planning their life together, including the home they would live in and the children that they would have together. In August of 2000, just days after the two began living together, Hall asks Sarah if his two friends that had fallen on hard times could come and stay with them for a bit. 25-year-old Andrew Cataldi was born on August 19, 1975. He and Richard Hall also met at a concert just like he and Sarah did. Hall was bouncing at this concert and he found Andrew passed out on top of a trailer during the show. He woke him up, helped him down, the two exchanged numbers, and they've actually been friends ever since. Andrew's girlfriend was 26-year-old Trisha Nordman. She was born on September 19th, 1974. Both had walked away from a halfway house, both had a criminal past, and both had warrants out for their arrest. 
Trisha had served time for forgery while Andrew served time for possession with intent to sell meth. So not great, but not the worst thing in the world. Hollow shorts are that he was a good guy, so she decided to take his word for it. And when she met the two, they hit it off immediately. Sarah described Andrew as very outgoing, very charismatic, and very brotherly. She described Trish as very quiet, very polite, and very sweet. Because the couples had become so close so fast, they decided to rent a two-bedroom house close to where Sarah worked. At the time, Sarah was the only one of the four with a legal job. Hall was unemployed, and Drew and Trish sold for a living. Eventually, they would let Richard in on the gig as well. Sarah's only demand was that they did not sell anything out of the home. She would later say in interviews that by the end of September, she came home to holes in her wall from arguments that the two were having. I should also make it known that all four of them were taking from their own stash, but allegedly not in excess. Sarah eventually got sick of everything and told Richard that it was time for him to get a real job and stop this hustle with Drew and Trish. He told Sarah that he couldn't do that, but he did agree to get a part-time bouncing gig on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday nights. Because this was the best nights for Drew's business, he didn't take the news very well. And by mid-October 2000, the tension in the home had reached a boiling point. The morning of October 24th, 2000, Hull convinces Sarah to take a ride with him to Walmart so that he could purchase a 12-gauge shotgun for him. This is because of his past brushes with the law. He could not obtain one. I guess could obtain one legally. Sarah and Richard go into the store and Sarah purchases the gun, the ammunition, a soda, and condoms. The clerk at Walmart confirms that Hull was the one that picked out the ammunition and Sarah was the one that paid for it. The two went out that evening with Sarah's parents and they returned home at around 11 p.m. An argument breaks out between the roommates that evening and Sarah claims she left to go for a walk to get cigarettes. October 25th, well, October 24th, 25th of 2000. Sarah says she returns to the home and finds Andrew and Trisha dead in her home from shotgun wounds. Even worse, it's her boyfriend, Richard, who is responsible for the deaths. Scared she would be the next to die, she helps Hull wrap the bodies in blankets and load them in the back of a pickup truck. A truck that Hull had borrowed on October 23rd to remove some items from the basement so he and Cataldi can make a meth lab down there. She goes with Hull to a dumpster on South Meridian Street and the two get a hotel room and Sarah never reports the incident. The following morning, October 25th, 2000, Sarah goes to work while Hull attempts to clean up the crime scene. Co-workers of Sarah's would describe her as upbeat and happy that day. But the million dollar question still remains. Why didn't she tell anyone while she was at work that day. This is also the day that the bodies of Andrew and Trish would be found at around 6 p.m. when an employee at the Teamsters went to throw his trash in the dumpster. There was no identification on either of the victims and because the bullets used were deer slug bullets, the bodies were unrecognizable. For context, Deer slug bullets are big metal bullets. Larry Sells, who's the prosecutor in on this case, says that the bodies were so badly damaged that they didn't even look like people. Andrew's entire chest was blown away and Trisha's head was misshapen. Because there was very little blood at the scene, police knew the crime happened elsewhere. Fingerprints were run, but both they both came back as no match. Because of this, police would have to run prints through the federal database, and that would take a few days. The reason for this was because Andrew and Trish were arrested in Las Vegas, so their prints did not show up in the town's database. While officers waited for the prints to come back, they showed images of the tattoos the victims had to the public 
hoping that someone would recognize them, and they did. Cops got the match from the Federal Fingerprint Database. It gave them the name, but not the address. So officers canvassed the area, trying to find out the address of these two victims. They find out that the two live on Michael Street and that they have two roommates, Richard Hall and Sarah Pender. The landlord would tell officers about the four tenants and give them a very important piece of information. Richard and Sarah had gone missing around the same time Drew and tested. This was enough information for police to secure a search warrant. And when they did, they walked into a bloodbath. There was blood on the walls, the floor, the couch, the bed, everywhere. DNA would determine that Drew was killed in the bedroom and Tess was killed in the TV room. A neighbor of the couple told police that he saw two people placing bodies in the back of a truck. So now the hunt is on for Sarah and Richard. Cops are able to get an address for Hull's mother and they begin watching the house. Friday, October 27th, 2000, at approximately 9 p.m., Sarah and Richard arrive at the home and they're apprehended by police. Richard claims that he killed the two in self-defense, but cops don't buy it. And Richard Hull is arrested and charged with of Andrew Cataldi and Trisha Nordman. So at this point, Sarah wasn't a suspect yet. They actually believed she had nothing to do with it. And because she fully cooperated with police, she was free to leave after her questioning was completed. Saturday, October 28th, 2000, after officers realized that Sarah was the person that purchased, she was arrested and also charged with the death of Drew and Trish. Although they believe she was not the person that pulled the trigger, they do believe she was the person that was pulling the strings. In January of 2003, Richard Hull pleads guilty to the double and is sentenced to 75 years in prison. It says at his trial that he does not feel guilty about what he did. In July of 2002, Sarah Pender goes on trial in a Marion Superior Court pleading not guilty. Prosecutor Larry Sells would dub her the female Charles Manson, claiming that she had hauled the roommates because she had been arguing with the couple over money and, you know, the D word. In 2001, a letter that was supposedly written by Sarah and sent to Hull was given to her lawyers. And this lawyer, this letter was allegedly a confession letter. Okay, so the letter reads, My dearest Richard, Hi honey, how's life? I thought I would write to get some things off my chest. First, I love you and I miss you so much. I want you to know that I will never forget you. I wish I could go back and change the events of that night. I should have gone to the L with you. Drew was so mean that night. I just snapped. I didn't mean to kill them. It must have been the acid. When you said that you would try and take the blame, I knew then that you loved me deeply. At first, I thought you would tell, but you stuck to your promise. As time goes on, I hope and pray that you beat this. Is your lawyer working hard for you? Thank you, my sweet baby bear. You are truly a wonderful person. It's hard to believe that a person can endure so much like we have. Well, my love, please keep me close to your heart. I'm going to lay down, my head is hurting. I hope you like the poems I've written for you. Love always, your lady bear. P.S. Destroy this. Sarah vehemently denies being the author of this letter. September of 2001, Sarah and another inmate named Floyd Pennington begin a jailhouse pen pal romance. Floyd is a convicted child toucher, but we all know that Sarah's standards are very low. So there's that. September 22nd, 2001, Sarah and Floyd fake illnesses so that they can meet each other at the Wishard Memorial Hospital. While there, Floyd claims that Sarah confided in him that she made Hull kill Drew and Tess. Officers would end up intercepting a letter between the two that would confirm that they did meet up at the hospital that day. 
July 22nd, 2002, a Marion Court jury finds Sarah Pender guilty of double homicide. August 22nd, 2002, a Marion Court judge sentences Sarah Pender to two consecutive terms, 50 years and 60 years for a total of 110 years in prison. January 2003, Hall pleads guilty to double and is sentenced to 75 years behind bars. After losing her appeals and running out of money, Sarah needed a new plan. She admitted that she should have gone to the cops after finding out about, but she also believed that she had done more than enough time for her crime. It was time to be released, and if the prison wasn't going to release her, she was going to release herself. So, she began a relationship with a prison guard at the jail by the name Scott Spittler. Scott Spittler was hired by Indiana Department of Corrections in May of 2003. Prior to this, he was on disability for almost a year because of an injury he suffered while he was working at a food delivery service. Rhonda, who was Spittler's wife at the time, later came out to say that after Spittler began working for the jail, he became a real jerk. During this time, Scott and Rhonda had been married for nine years. When the two married, they each had children. Rhonda had a 15-year-old and Scott had two children. The majority of the children were grown and living outside of the Spittler home that was located one hour away from the jail. Rhonda would later say that the marriage had issues from the start, with Spittler cheating on her just two weeks after they wed. Two weeks. The ink on your wedding license is not even dry yet. Spittler was sleeping with a few of the girls at the jail, and Sarah was one of them. There's a chemical room in the jail that didn't have cameras and that Spittler had the key to. So when Sarah and Spittler started sleeping together in the chemical room, Sarah knew that if he was willing to take this kind of risk, he would be willing to take bigger risks. Sarah said it was at that moment that she knew Spittler was the man for the job. Spittler started off bringing in his wife's Vicodin and Xanax and Benadryl that Sarah would sell to inmates. He would bring them inside of novelty Coca-Cola bottles along with three cell phones, one for Sarah and one for two other inmates. Rhonda was in a car accident in 2002, which put her on disability. But because Rhonda didn't like taking pills, she rarely paid attention to how many she had and if any were missing. Sarah is adamant about the fact that she never blackmailed Spittler. She promised him $50,000 to help her escape and around $300 to bring in the pills. It absolutely seems as though Spittler was very much a willing participant. The money that Sarah was making from the sale of the pills was being sent to friends outside of the jail for Sarah to have when she escapes prison to live off of. Monday, August 4th, 2008, was a beautiful, sunny summer day. Sarah walked from her bunk to the prison dormitory, which was about a five-minute walk. Inside the rec room were pool tables, a popcorn machine, weight training machines, and flat-screen TVs. It was approximately 2.30, and the jail was conducting visits for certain inmates. This was all part of Sarah's plan, and there would be people inside of the jail in civilian clothing. Sarah went into the gymnasium that was adjacent to the rec room where she had a pair of civilian clothes waiting for her. She changed into jeans and a solid tee. She took her prison clothes and tossed them in an open ceiling tile. From there, she walked right past the administrative building and vendors dropping off supplies to the jail. She walked through another door down a hundred foot hallway and through an unmanned security fence. She already knew that the gate would be open because Spittler had told her so. After she was through the gate, she got into a white prison van that was at the fueling station. She, she slipped in through the passenger side rear door, scrunched out on the floor, and said a prayer. Spittler had a prison guard uniform in the van waiting for her to change into, so she did. Spittler finishes fueling up the van and makes his way to the gates, leading Sarah to her freedom. So it's policy at the jail 
that vans stop at the gates and get checked. This is to ensure that officers are not under duress while leaving the jail for things such as escapes. Spittler stopped the van and got out to speak to the guard. He believed that if he got out, went up to the guard and spoke to the guard that the van would not be checked and he was right. The gates were open and just like that, Sarah was free. Sitting in the parking lot was a 1993 Oldsmobile with a woman by the name of Jamie Long. Sarah and Jamie knew each other briefly while Jamie was behind bars in 2004 due to her drinking habits. But today she was at jail for a very different reason. She was there to drive Sarah away. Jamie was married to a man that she had known for over 20 years by the name of John Long. He was a handyman and a military vet. Sarah got into the back of Jamie's truck and changed from her prison guard suit into civilian clothes once again, and the two took off. The two toasted the successful escape with some pills and vodka that Jamie had brought along, and they drove 68 miles to Indianapolis, Indiana. Park County Sheriff's deputies arrested Corrections Officer Scott Spittler early this morning. Spittler, who worked as a transportation officer at the Rockville Correctional Facility, stands charged with having a sexual relationship with the inmate and conspired to help her escape. Sarah Pender was serving a 110-year sentence at Rockville. Prison officials say that Spittler drove a prison van inside the gates and then hid Pender in the vehicle. Investigators say the guard then drove the van outside to the parking lot, where Pender then got into a waiting vehicle and drove away. It would take the prison about two hours and wouldn't be until somebody snitched on them for them to realize that Sarah was missing. The jail went into lockdown and two headcounts were conducted. It was at that point that they realized that Sarah was indeed gone. Sarah Pender was the first inmate to ever escape from this prison, and they hope she's the last. And it is difficult to protect yourself against one of your own, and but we've taken every precaution possible. They've added new cameras throughout the entire prison. Now, having a relationship like Spittler and Pender's behind prison walls is virtually impossible. Somebody's always monitoring the cameras. Um, there's always officers and executive staff have access to the footage on the cameras. Not only are these prisoners being closely monitored, everyone is now searched at the front door, even staffers. And getting in or out of the prison is even tougher. When you see it that it can really happen, everybody is on a a heightened security level. It's not just security. They're now training male staffers how to deal with manipulative female inmates. That's what they say led to Spittler helping Pender escape. The male staff member in this case fell for some of her tactics and found his weak points and used them to her advantage. Less than 12 hours after that, Spittler would confess to the whole thing and news of this escape would hit the media. This would also be how Spittler's wife would find out about what her husband had been up to. While Rhonda was cleaning out her husband's dresser drawer, she would come across a $200 money order that was made out to Jamie Long for Sarah to use during her escape. Rhonda gave it to state troopers who were conducting a search of her home. She wanted nothing more than for Sarah to be caught and put back behind bars where she belonged. I feel like... Like I should be telling everybody I'm sorry and I didn't do anything. I would just like to wonder what he was thinking. He has lost everything he ever had. For what? Rhonda says she got a phone call from Scott Tuesday morning but didn't learn all the details until she turned on the news. I asked him what was going on and what did you do? And all he's, he said, all he's, he just said one more. He just said uh, for the skate. And I didn't even know what that meant. Embarrassed his family, and I feel so ashamed, and I feel so bad for those people that trusted him. Rhonda's hoping her husband is watching the news right now. I guess he can find out on the 6 o'clock news, just like I found out, that he'll be getting divorce papers here in a couple days. Indiana Department of Corrections not only let a convicted double murderer, who was dubbed the female Charles Manson, walk out of their jail, but they also didn't find it necessary to contact the families of the victims to let them know what had happened. Andrew Cataldi's big brother found out when a friend called him to tell him that it was on the news. Worse than that, though, was the fact that Stephen Cataldi lived quite close to Sarah's mother's home in Florida. So 
For all he knew, she could have been headed there right now. While all of this was going on, Jamie and Sarah met up with Jamie's husband. They got out of their car, they got into his Jeep and kept driving. Jamie's husband would then take the escape vehicle and drive it to Jamie's parents' house just in case they should be looking for a getaway car. So Jamie takes Sarah to a second home that the couple owned just a few blocks from their main home. Larry had been working on the home for quite some time. The house had piles of clothes and magazines everywhere. It was nowhere near completion, but it was a place to hide out. Jamie got Sarah settled with some clothes, a flashlight, a blow-up bed, and a new prepaid cell phone before leaving to pick up some more things at her local CVS. Jamie was walking back from the store. A cop pulled her over and began questioning her about Sarah's whereabouts. The ser they searched her bag, but all they find is some candy and a few prepaid cell phones. Sarah would later say that if they had trailed Jamie just a little bit longer, she would have led them right to where Sarah was hiding out because that's where she was going. She was on her way to bring Sarah the rest of the stuff from CVS. Jamie calls Sarah immediately on the burner phone and tells her that she's got to move now because cops are trailing her. Sarah calls Peggy Darlington next, another ex-con that Sarah met while doing time together. Peggy was living with her sister at the time and her sister's husband was a cop. So she and her sister snuck Sarah in and hid her for the night. The following day, Sarah called her mother, Bonnie, to let her know that she was okay and that she loved her, but it might be a month or so before she spoke to her again. Sarah had multiple burner phones, and she never used the same phone more than once for fear that it could be traced somehow. Sarah would end up making the U.S. Marshals Top 15 Wanted list, and then there was actually a $25,000 reward out for her. It was at this point that her case was turned over to Ryan Harmon. Ryan was the person that searched for escapees and other fugitives for the Indiana State Police. Ryan would explain that in order to catch Sarah, he had to think like her. In order to think like her, he had to, have, he had to talk to everyone that knew her. He started with Jamie Long. He knocked on the door and explained to Jamie that he knew she was the person that picked her up from jail. And he knew that she had a son and that he wanted to work with her, not send her to jail. Jamie agrees to help, but she starts off the conversation with a lie, telling him that she dropped Sarah off at a Southern Plaza and said the last thing that she said to her was that she was going to move to a rural hiding spot. She agreed to call Sarah and put her on speakerphone so Harmon could hear the conversation. When Sarah answers the phone, Harmon says that he believes some kind of code must have been made because Sarah tells Jamie she's loving the rural life, that she's about 45 miles away, and that she just had a great breakfast. In actuality, Sarah is 10 minutes away hiding out at Peggy's sister's house. Two days after his first initial visit with Jamie on August 7th, Harmon showed up to Jamie Long's house and had her arrested. It was at that point that Jamie would hand over two boxes that contained letters, pictures, journals, and a number of money orders, totaling around $1,700 that were needed to fund the escape. Jamie Long was given seven years for aiding in the escape of Sarah Pender. On February 17th, 2009, Scott Spittler pled guilty to aiding an escape and was sentenced to eight years in prison. Sarah was out $1,700 though at this point and she needed money pretty badly. The last bit of money she had was $200 that Jamie gave her before she was arrested. Peggy dropped Sarah off at a Motel 6 where she left her with some food and dark brown hair dye. The following morning, Sarah called a sex worker friend of hers named Thea Fisher. Thea and Sarah met while doing time together in prison. Thea picked Sarah up and brought her over to her home. Sarah told Thea that she needed enough money to be independent and a way to get the hell out of here. So Thea, who had multiple sugar daddies, tells Sarah that she has a plan. August 6, 2008, Tom Welch waited at his budget hotel room for a 30-year-old girl by the name of Ashley Thompson. In actuality, it was Sarah using the alias Ashley, and she was there to have 
sex with Tom Welch for money. Ashley told Tom that she had a pretty tough life, claiming that she was trying to get away from her A-B-U-S-I-V-E ex-husband who was a cop because she was trying to divorce him. Tom and Ashley actually met through Thea, who would dance at a club that Tom liked to go to. The two had even went out to eat together and had sex on a few occasions. 53-year-old Tom was married to his wife, Marilyn, who worked at American Express as a reservation agent and worked her way up to Director of Marketing Development. Between the money that Marilyn was making and the big bucks Tom was making from owning a trucking firm, the couple was pretty well off. So, Ashley, where did Ashley come from? Well, Sarah had actually been planning this alias since before her escape. She planned the birthday for August 8th because that was her father's birthday, and then she decided to take a year off her birthday. So, her new fake birthday would be August 8th, 1978. And it was during this time that she would also pick the name Ashley Thompson. Thea told Sarah that Tom had been requesting a three-way and he was willing to pay for it. Because Sarah needed the money so badly, she was willing to do what she had to. Sarah would actually later say that she was really pleased with Tom and was very taken back about how he had to pay for the puss because he was such a good looking guy and, and such I guess a well put together guy in her opinion when they were done Tom asked Ashley where she was going and she told him that she had to go look for a room because she needed somewhere to stay so that's when Tom decided to get a room for the next three days and the couple basically spent the majority of that time just in the room having sex her supposed friend the one that hooked her up with Tom to begin with, would actually tell Tom that her real name was not Ashley, that it was Sarah Pender, and that she was a prison escapee. But at this point, Tom was in so deep with her that he didn't care. She told him that she didn't do it, she wasn't guilty of it, and that was more than enough for him. It wasn't until the news ran a story about Sarah and her photo came across the screen that he knew for certain that Ashley Thompson was indeed Sarah Pender. What was supposed to be a one night ordeal for money ended with Sarah and Tom falling pretty hard for each other. Saturday, August 9th, 2008, Sarah and Tom finally decide to leave the budget in that they'd been hiding out at. Sarah told Tom she didn't do anything. Oh no. Tom suggested that they go to the casino and Sarah was all in. So the two jumped in the car and they drove two and a half hours away to Rising Sun, Indiana to the Grand Victoria Casino and Resort. The two would spend the weekend there and then after the weekend was over, she told Tom that the one thing she really wanted was a job. Comes to find out that Tom actually has a friend since childhood named Paul Bridges, who owns a construction company. Because Paul was getting ready to go have hip surgery, he needed somebody with construction office experience to hold things down for him. Tom told Paul the Ashley Bridges story about the husband that she's trying to escape, and Ashley Bridges now had a job. Welch left Sarah at the Forest Park Suites, which is a six-story business hotel with a pool, workout room, and free breakfast buffet. Sarah would say that she never worried about Welch turning her in because at this point, he was already harboring a fugitive, but she did worry that if Paul Bridges found out, would he turn her in? By the time Paul returned to work on August 15th, Sarah was living in a small condo on the work site. The condo was a two-bedroom condo, and I believe that it belonged to Bridges, because one bedroom was for Sarah and one bedroom was for Bridges. But after he felt comfortable with Sarah running the office, he would leave her there frequently. At one point, Sarah called Peggy on her burner phone, and Peggy begged Sarah to turn herself in, telling her that the cops have been on their tails, but Sarah refused. During this time, Ryan Harmon was still out looking for Sarah, and he wasn't giving up. He made his way over to the Pendleton Correctional Facility to talk to Rick Hull. He also made his way over to Sarah's father's house to talk to him. 
And he would actually end up getting Sarah's father on his side because Sarah's father realized that it would be better for Sarah to be in jail than to be dead. And if she didn't get back to jail, she was probably going to be dead. Monday, September 1st, 2008, Tim had left from visiting Sarah to drive two and a half hours back to his home and his wife. Sarah was calling and texting Tim, but her calls went unanswered. That's when she thought it'd be a good idea to call Paul Bridges to see if he could get in touch with Tom. Okay, well, Paul's wife, Kimberly, answers the phone. And because she was never told about Ashley Bridges, she pretty much loses her shit, okay? Not having it. Paul tried to explain to her that Ashley was just there helping out the business and Kim, who is a fourth degree black belt, told her she was coming down to that condo and she better not be there when she arrived. Sarah didn't think Tom would turn her in, but she knew that if she had to go back to the old life of turning tricks to survive, she would do it. So because Tom wasn't answering her, she decided to write him a letter that said in part, I can and will if I have to, but I don't want to leave you. She told Welch how much she loved him and wanted to be with him. She also told him bits and pieces about the real story of the saying, I'm not sorry they are dead. People die all the time for lots of reasons, many at young ages. Killing people is not such a big deal because people die. We are human. As Alara goes on, she speaks to Welch about him telling her that he wants to kill his wife, saying... I know you think life would be easier if you, your wife, it wouldn't. Do you know what sort of pain the family will go through? Especially when you quickly move on to another woman. If you want to keep me, get divorced and work more days. This is because the wife probably would have taken him for everything. It works a lot better than thinking you could just keep and be invincible. She ended her letter by telling him that she enjoyed the ride and that she didn't want it to ever stop and that she loved him. Sarah and Tom would actually end up getting back in touch and Tom would drive her down to her new destination, Chicago. She was originally going to stay with Tom's niece's friend. But once they got there, he decided that it would be better for her to stay with Tom's niece. And even though it wasn't the best area in the world, she would only be three hours away from him. With the help of Tom's niece, Sarah was able to get a job at a construction company. Tom would come down on the weekends to see her, and then he would go back home to his wife during the week. Because the commute was becoming a little much, her new boss helped her get an apartment much closer to work. Okay. September 13th, 2008, the first episode of America's Most Wanted detailing Sarah's case airs. September 27th, 2008, America's Most Wanted does an update on Sarah's case, saying that they, she was hinting at some new tips, but that none of them were solid leads. November 4th, 2008, tens of thousands of people show up to Grant Park, to hear President Obama deliver his acceptance speech. December 20th, 2008, America's Most Wanted does a roundup show about the hardest to find criminals. Sarah would end up being number five of 15 on that list. Then at approximately 10 p.m. that evening, a call comes in from a tipster. The tipster says that a woman who was just on America's Most Wanted is living just a few minutes away at 2204 West farewell apartments in Rogers Park. He tells them that the show is calling her Sarah, but that he only knows her as Ashley Thompson. Then the caller would hang up before any more questions could be asked. Shortly after that, Sarah Pender, Ashley Thompson's escape would come to an end. So following her arrest, Sarah was brought to the Indiana Women's Prison in Indianapolis from December of 2008 to January 30th of 2014 for a total of 1,870 days in solitary confinement. 
on January 25th, 2018, she was transferred back to Rockville Correctional Facility, where she now lives just like she did before in a two-woman cell. She works in the prison library, and she actually helps um, other inmates with appeals. She has currently exhausted all of her legal appeals, and she will not be eligible for parole until April 4th, 2054, when she will be 75 years old. So her mother and her sister have started a Facebook page, Free Sarah Jo Pender, and they're asking for the public's help to let their sister out who they believe i guess who everybody believes is innocent if she i mean if she really is innocent she has paid her dues june 2nd 2003 richard hull signs an affidavit stating that on october 24th of 2000 he was the one that andrew cataldi and trish nordman saying that Sarah did not commit this crime. Then it goes on to say, she did not print the letter to which I gave to my lawyer, Jennifer Lukemeyer. Sarah was set up by me. I had Stephen Logan print the letter while we were in the same block together at the Marion County Jail. I did this so I could get a good plea. She did not know that this was going to happen. I have been carrying this burden for some time now. I like to make right on the wrongs that have been done to Miss Pender. I've drew and Trisha's lives on my hands. I can't have Sarah's. The only reason to why she was with me after the crime was because she was scared for her life. Please keep in mind that I did just my best friend and his girlfriend. If the state would like, I will give a new statement to tell what really happened. I will also tell how I passed the polygraph test. Please contact me as soon as possible so I can clear up this matter and set an innocent lady free. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to hearing from the state. Richard Hull. September 6, 2005, Richard Hull testifies in court that he had a fellow inmate write the letter, forge the letter, really, for him and say that it was from Sarah Pender. There were only two sets of fingerprints on that letter. One was Richard Hull's and the other one was his cellmate, Steve Logan's. This letter is what put Sarah away for 110 years. That's a big deal. Hull did get a new trial, but because of the forging of the letter, the judge decided to change his Sentence from 75 years to 90 years. <laughs> I mean, I guess it doesn't matter either way, but, you know, imagine you fought for a new trial and then your sentence goes up. September 21st, 2019, Rick Hull's cellmate, Steve Logan, signs an affidavit that says, My, my name is Steve Logan. In 2001, at the age of 18, I was incarcerated in the Marion County Jail for the first time in my young life. And while I was incarcerated, I came in contact with a man by the name of Richard Hull, who was being held for... He had a co-defendant by the name Sarah Pender. Richard Hull directed me to write a letter claiming to be Sarah in which she would confess to the crimes in hopes of Richard Hull receiving a lesser sentence. Richard Hull showed me samples of Sarah Pender's handwriting in the form of other letters in order to try and copy her handwriting. Richard Hull dictated the words that needed to be used in the letter, telling me word for word what to write. And quite frankly, after learning what he had done, I was terrified. I felt very alone, threatened for my safety as well as my life now knowing what Richard Hull was capable of doing to me and possibly my family had I not complied with his demands. I believe I was bullied, manipulated, and coerced into writing this letter or used against Sarah Pender at her trial as evidence to convict her at her trial. In 2005, when questioned about the letter, I lied and said that I did not write it. I am deeply remorseful for my stupidity, along with being young, ignorant, 
gullible and afraid and not necessarily aware of the severity of the situation and the consequences of my actions. I felt like I was in a lose-lose situation in that moment. I want to take this opportunity to be a man by doing the right thing, by telling the truth and right my wrongs. I am also doing this in hopes that it helps get Sarah justice and gives her a second chance at life with her family. I am willing to testify to these facts in court. In fall of 2009, Larry Sells, the prosecutor that put Sarah away for 110 years, begins working with author Steve Miller, which, by the way, is where I got a huge chunk of this information for this story. Really good book. The two begin research on Sarah's case for a true crime novel while going through old detective files. Larry Sells comes across the snitch list. The list was written by Floyd Pennington, the pen pal of Sarah, the child toucher, the one that she met at the hospital. Okay, the list was written by Floyd, who was the state's star witness during Sarah's trial, and they were unaware of this list at that time. They would later find out that Floyd had this snitch list and he would make false testimonies in court so that he would get lesser sentences. The spring of 2012, Larry Sells retires and he reads Miller's book. It is at this point that he realizes Sarah was falsely accused and convicted of a crime that she did not commit. He is adamant about this and he is is coming out and saying... I put her away for 110 years. I called her the female Charles Manson. She's innocent. He even reaches out to Sarah's mother and tells Sarah's mother that he is going to help get Sarah a new trial. I don't actually know if it will because she did escape. All right. So let's talk about the affidavit of Larry Sells. It is crazy. I, Larry Sells, swear or affirm under oath the following. Since being admitted to practical law in the state of Indiana in 1972, I have served as a deputy prosecutor a total of approximately 22 years, including at least 16 years in the Marion County Prosecutor's Office. I have handled thousands of criminal cases and have prosecuted over 200 jury trials, including nearly 70 cases, from June 1991 until my retirement in February of 2006. I was employed in the Marion County Prosecutor's Office. The last position I held was Special Trial Counsel for the Marion County Prosecutor. As such, I prosecuted death penalty, high profile, and complex murder cases. Beginning in 2000, I prosecuted the case of State of Indiana vs. Sarah Jo Pender and Richard Hull. They were charged with of their two roommates, Andrew Cataldi and Trish Nordman. The case against Pender and Hull served for trial. During Pender's trial in 2002, one of the significant items of evidence I presented to the jury was the testimony of Floyd Pennington. Pennington was an inmate who had been corresponding with Sarah Pender in the jail before her trial. For a period of time, Pennington had been a cellmate of Richard Hull in the Marion County Jail while their respective cases were pending. At trial, Pennington testified that he and Sarah had arranged to meet at Wishard Hospital on September 22, 2001. Pennington testified that while at the hospital, Sarah confessed to him that she did not Cataldi and Nordman, but that she coerced Hull to do it. Pennington also testified that Sarah admitted she planned to have Hull commit the Finally, Pennington testified that he had received no consideration for his testimony that day. Sarah Pender was convicted and received an executed sentence of 110 years in prison. In 2009, I was contacted by author Steve Miller, who was working on a book about Sarah Pender. 
At his request, I accompanied him to review Detective Kenneth Martinez's homicide files on Sarah's case as research for his book. Within the homicide files was a file folder marked Floyd Pennington. Inside that file folder was, among other things, a two-page list. Snitch list. Apparently written and signed by Floyd Pennington. The list contained the names of people and crime organizations that Pennington was prepared to assist police in busting people and organizations that supposedly he was intimately familiar with and trusted by. I was shocked when I saw that snitch list. I had never seen it before and was at a loss to understand why Detective Martinez did not provide it to me. Had I known about it, I would have disclosed it to counsel for Pender and Hull. That document went to the very heart of Pennington's motive for testifying against Sarah Pender and indicated the lengths to which Pennington was willing to go to gain some consideration for himself. Pennington testified at trial that his motive for meeting Pender at Wishard was to try and find out where their jailhouse romance stood. That snitch list would have destroyed any credibility Pennington had as a witness and would have caused me to doubt his truthfulness had I known about the list. I could not have called him as a witness under those circumstances. In 2009, I attempted to contact Kenneth Martinez to find out why and when he had received the snitch list and why he did not provide it to me. I learned he was somewhere in Afghanistan and was unavailable. I believe that something should be done regarding the matter, but I had not worked in the Marion County Prosecutor's Office for over three years and was not certain what to do. Months passed and the matter receded in my memory. Then, in 2012, while rereading Steve Miller's book, Girl Wanted, The Chase for Sarah Pender, published in June of 2011, I came across a passage in the book describing the finding of the snitch list. It reminded me that something needed to be done. That I have endeavored to do what I think is appropriate. Looking at Sarah Pender's case objectively. I have come to the conclusion that Pennington's testimony and another item of evidence, evidence which now appears suspect, presented by me at Pender's trial, were the linchpins of the prosecution's case and were instrumental in her conviction. Although Sarah Pender's behavior before and after the, of Cataldi and Norman does not appear to be consistent with the theory of innocence, she nonetheless did not receive a fair trial because of the non-disclosure of the snitch list. It is my considered opinion that a retrial would serve no purpose. I believe that Pennington would be of no value except to the defense. That other item of evidence, the confession letter, purportedly written by Pender, then provided to the prosecution by Hull through his attorney, is highly suspect in light of testimony presented at Pender's 2005 PCR hearing. And as well, Richard Hull would likely be called as a defense witness at any retrial or his 2006 PCR hearing testimony would be introduced sh to show that he confessed to and cleared Pender of, Pender would undoubtedly be only convicted of assisting a criminal, a Class C felony. I know of no credible evidence that exists to prove that Sarah Pender participated in the actual of Cataldi and Nordman. Signed, Larry Sells. This is crazy. What? This is crazy, guys. All right, guys. If you're still here, thank you, thank you, thank you. I love you, and I appreciate you so, so, so very much. I really hope you like this one. Um, leave me your thoughts and comments. Please like. Please subscribe if you haven't yet and you feel so inclined to because it really helps me out. And I really need it because, you know, YouTube really doesn't like true crime stories. So there's that. Um, and until next time, stay safe out there.